motion pictures have never been made in Hollywood, California. Bandits used barbed wire to rob a bank. Dolly Madison was the only woman in private life to be accorded the privileges of the floor in the U.S. House of Representatives. Can you imagine that? Once more, friends, this is Lindsay McCary bringing you another session of this series in which we try to amaze you with odd facts and unusual news stories from the past. We'll be back with you in just one and a half minutes. Will you wait for us? And here's our first interesting item. It's really two in one because, well, just listen to the gentleman from Tennessee speaking on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives on Jackson Day, January 8, 1844. Oh, Mr. Speaker, what a colossal blot of shame rests upon this great government this day. This day, Mr. Speaker, we honor that great soldier and statesman, our revered and beloved seventh president of these United States, Andrew Jackson. Mr. Speaker, while we so do him this just honor, that grand old man of 77 years rests quietly in his home in Nashville, harassed by the shameful knowledge that this government had seen fit one horrible day to levy a fine of $1,000 upon him for contempt of court, but really for the assiduous execution of his faithful duty as he saw it. Will the gentleman from Tennessee yield? I yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yes. I've just noticed a beloved person sitting in the gallery of this house, a woman whose memory shall ever be revered by this nation because of her heroic acts 32 years ago, in saving from the hands of an enemy, one of our most precious historic documents, the Declaration of Independence. Of course, I refer to Mrs. Dolly Payne Madison, widow of our fourth president. <laughs> Thus did the United States House of Representatives honor 74-year-old Dolly Madison, widow of James Madison, by according her the privileges of the floor of the house. Up to the present writing, Dolly Madison is the only woman in private life who has ever been accorded this honor. Can you imagine that? It was also during that same year, 1844, that Congress ordered Andrew Jackson's $1,000 contempt of court fine to be repaid with interest. The aged ex-president later received a U.S. government warrant to the amount of $2,700. You've often heard the expression, you can drive a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, from a newspaper of more than 35 years ago comes this story. Mr. Charles Cott was driving his horse and wagon down a street in Chicago on a cold, wintry, mid-December day. Perhaps Mr. Cott had a little early Christmas spirit. At any rate, as he drove along... Uh, today's the other way we go. To la, to la, da, da, da. Oh, 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 oh. oh. 
Just look, there's good old Quigley Saloon. I gotta stop and have a little drink. Steady, boy. Steady. Ah. You know, there's nothing like a little drink on a cold December day. No, sir. Now, you wait here, boy. You wait here and I'll be right up. Oh, no. No, you don't have to wait here. You're coming with me. Horses got to get warm inside, too. And I'll get you in the harness there. You and me will have a little drink of good old quickly saloon. Now, come on. <laughs> what old Quigley be surprised? <laughs> come on, let's go. Come on. Well, what do you say? What? Oh, yes, you do want a drink. Now, come on. Don't be stubborn. You can have a little drink with me. Come on, now. You can have a drink, I tell you. Oh, come on. Mr. Cott's horse did not enter Quigley's for the little drink, but uh, Mr. Cott did enter court the next day, charged with disturbing the peace. Perhaps the judge was an animal fancier, for his sentence was... Charles Cott, I appreciate the motives, but not the method. I'm going to let you off, though, and find you merely the court cost. But hereafter, don't try to drag your horse into a saloon. So did Charles Cott of Chicago learn the full force of the old proverb, you can drive a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Can you imagine that? The ultimate in bank robbery stories comes from a newspaper of January 2, 1909. It seems that in Wellston, Oklahoma, some of the townspeople were surprised to see... Ah, but listen. Hey, what's the idea over there by the bank? Look. Hey, what's going on? I didn't hear nothing about them building a barbed wire fence around the place. What do you suppose the idea? I don't know. Well, let's... Hey, look. Them fellas building the fence have got guns. Well, yeah. What? Well, some of them are scattering along the fence... That's a holdup. Darned if it ain't. Them fellas built that fence to hold us off while they robbed the bank. Get the rest of the yeah. boys, quick. Get them. While the citizens of Wellston were kept at bay by the robbers within the enclosure formed by the fence, the robbers worked on the vault, and suddenly... They got it. They blew the vault. And here they come. Look out. The robbers got away after a running gun battle, and with them went $5,000 from the vault of the Bank of Wellston. And this robbery remains the first and only case I can find of bank robbers actually building a fence around the bank and then proceeding calmly to rob the bank while some of them held off the townspeople by means of a barbed wire fence and bullets. Can you imagine that? Mr. James Artlip of Aurora, Illinois, likes the movies. Oh, you don't think that's new, huh? Well, Mr. Artlip is 68 years old. And on February 24th, 1939, he saw his first movie. When interviewed, said the newest fan of Hollywood's make-believe, Yes, sir, I think they got something there. I sure do like them. Honestly, it's, it's well, it's just marvelous. Pictures actually move on the screen, and uh, you can hear the actors talk. You like them, huh? You bet I do. I uh, think I'll go see another one sometime. Well, why have you taken so long to get to a movie, Mr. Artlip? <clears throat> well, uh, <clears throat> I just never got around to it before. I pass four theaters every day, but I just never thought about going into one. Well, what made you go in this time? Why, uh, <clears throat> I saw it was a picture about Jesse James. Thought I might just as well see it, because uh, uh, I read a book about him. So chalk up another conquest for Hollywood and the flickering photos, even though it did take them 68 years to win Mr. James Artlip. Can you imagine that? Do you remember this startling statement at the beginning of the program? Motion pictures have never been made in Hollywood, California. Well, like our others, that statement is true. Why? Because there is no such recognized town or city of Hollywood, California. It wasn't until the year 1910 that the motion picture producers realized that their needs for strong lighting could be filled by the brilliant Southern California sunshine and came to that region to build their first studios. They settled in the portion of the city of Los Angeles which had been the town of Hollywood. But in that same year, 1910, previous to the arrival of these first movie magnets, the town of Hollywood had already been annexed to the city of Los Angeles. And so our statement is true... Motion pictures have never been made in Hollywood, California. Can you imagine that? Well, now let's do a little foraging into the field of melody sleuthing. First of all, I want you to listen to a semi-classic selection, which I'm sure you've heard before many, many times. The orchestra is going to play only a few measures, so listen carefully. And as you listen, 
Try to recollect the name of the number itself and also the more modern, popular number which this semi-classic selection most resembles. Are you ready? All right, listen. Now, what was the name of that selection? Oh, I remember that, Lindsay. It's Cavatina by the famous German composer Josef Joachim Raff. That's right, Raff's Cavatina. Well, now, among all of you here assembled, did anyone recognize it as the possible foundation of one of our most popular hits of a few years ago? I, I think I did, Lindsay. All right, what is it? My Baby's Arms. And that is also correct, My Baby's Arms. Listen now, ladies and gentlemen, and see whether or not there is a distinct similarity between Raff's Cavatina and that smash hit from the Ziegfeld Follies of 1919, My Baby's Arms. And there you have it once more, friends, one more session of Can You Imagine That? We all hope you'll be listening on this same station when next we're scheduled to meet. Until that time, this is Lindsay McCary turning you over to the very good care of your own station announcer and saying goodbye now.